Do you know the 14 traits of successful chiropractors? We've interviewed some of the top chiropractors in the industry and have identified the common traits that they all share. Jump on over to www.chirobusinessmojo.com to get your free report today. Welcome to the Cairo Business Mojo Podcast, where we deconstruct the methods, marketing, and mindset of successful business people and chiropractors from around the world. And now your host, Dr. Richard Day. Yes, I am Dr. Richard Day, and this is the Cairo Business Mojo Podcast. Hey there, and thanks so much for checking in with us. Well, today I've got someone on the show who is no stranger to the chiropractic profession. In fact, he has been around quite a while. He is Dr. Larry Markson. He's been a personal empowerment, practice and business success, and prosperity coach to over 100,000 people for the past 35 years. He's devoted his professional life to helping others transform their thoughts, actions, and feelings until they are able to experience the fulfillment of their inner dreams and life's goals. He believes that your business and your personal life are waiting for a leader, you, to show up for that. Who you are inside the skin determines how well you do what works. Now in his fifth decade of sharing his secrets of success with audiences from only 25 at the Cabin Experience to over 8,000 as keynote speaker or special guest speaker for outside businesses and organizations, he has learned that it is successful people who build successful businesses and lives, and that success comes from you, not to you. Welcome, Dr. Larry Markson. Hey, hi there, Rich. Good to meet you. Yeah, great to talk with you today, and I invite you to jump in and fill in any of those gaps in the bio that I may have missed. Well, I don't think that's necessary because the bio is the past, and I think we should go ahead and move to the future and see if we can help the people from Mojo Nation and the other people who listen to this enjoy a better life and a more fulfilling practice. All right. Well, you know, in researching you and your story and uh, the things you've done in your life, I read that you failed big time before you learn to succeed. So can you tell us about that? Well, I was raised in chiropractic as a patient from seven years of age. I suffered from bronchial asthma. And remember, these are the days before I was raised in New York, before chiropractic was even licensed. So we had a backdoor chiropractor, so to speak. It wasn't legal, but it wasn't illegal. So as a proverbial last resort for living in oxygen, oxygen tents, I went. So after a few years of chiropractic care, here I am breathing, running, playing like normal children. So I dedicated myself to become a chiropractor when I grew up, and I did. I went from high school directly to Palmer. I was 17 years of age. There was no prerequisites for chiropractic uh, college prior to getting your degree. In fact, I had to wait uh, 21 days to get my license. I wasn't 21 years of age yet. And so I started off as a sickly child. I started off with a family that is now, I guess you could call it dysfunctional. I got out of school. I graduated valedictorian, and I'm not saying that to to uh, brag. I'm just saying that because I studied. I wanted to be a chiropractor. I loved it. And I came back to New York and I opened a practice and failed for seven years. For seven years later, I was seeing 30 to 70 people a week and I was exaggerating and lying even then. So I felt good about myself, but certainly I was not able to make a living for myself or my family being a chiropractor. And I wondered, how could that be? So uh, during this time, my marriage turned bad, so I ended up divorced. I had no money. I was in debt. And a friend of mine invited me to a Parker seminar. This was in March 9th, 1969. Most of your listeners were probably not even born then. And um, I went to a Parker seminar, and that was the moment and the day that changed my life because I walked out. Uh, um, uh, Doc, uh, having a feeling, a deep-seated feeling that if one person can succeed, I can too. I'm no dumber. I'm no smarter. I'm no different. I'm a human being, and there has to be some success principles. So I failed uh, financially, I said, in marriage. I failed in, in practice, I, it Just and I had every excuse in the world just like everyone else does. And then I said, uh, one of the remarks that Jim Parker made that day, he said, God doesn't sponsor any failures, and that if you are to succeed, it's up to you. So I walked out saying that if someone else could succeed, I can, and that was the beginning. So I, just, I went on a 10-year study to answer one question, and that was, what makes one man or one woman 
let's say one chiropractor more successful than another? Was it the office? Was it their location? Was it their height or their weight or their religion or the color of their skin or how left brain or right brain they are? I didn't know. Now, after 10 years, I started to understand. So I went into over 2,000 chiropractic offices years and years. So I, I, I ended up learning how to design and build them. And I built hundreds and hundreds of them later on in life. But I realized that it was the person that becomes successful, not the place or technique or school they graduated from. So that was my story in a nutshell. Wow, there's a whole lot there. I think I want to dig a little deeper into each one of those. And I guess it starts with our sense of self. Where do we get that originally? I know it's family. What else? Well, I, well, I call it the mother, father, teacher, preacher. MFTP, so all the people that have been in my, in Marks and Management Services and the Master's Circle and the Marks and Connection and the Cabin Experience, the four or five different businesses that I've had in chiropractic, all of which were very successful because I was started to use the principles that I was learning over this 10 year study. So if I came into your office and I saw something that was working better than mine, I threw mine out and no longer had proprietary rights and I just adopted and modified yours and put it into practice. So I was using all good successful thing and I saw the way you talk to your patients and the way you dress. So it is, it's mother, big influence of you and father, of course, a big influence. Stereotypical in the old days, the father was the money maker and the mother stayed at home. Not true in today's day and age, but was true for me. And my father was a pretty rough uh, disciplinarian and my mother learned to give guilt and not on purpose. So I didn't grow up with the right thinking and then environmentally. So we didn't live in in the right neighborhood. We do, I didn't associate with the right people. So if it's your mother and father, teachers, uh, the T is teachers, and that doesn't mean only your teachers in school, in, in elementary or high school, or even college and chiropractic college. It means anyone that teaches you something, television teaches you something, the newspapers teach you, peer pressure teaches you. Anyone that taught you something, you get to believe what they say to be true. So here's my saying about that. And then preachers, let me just finish MFTP is not a preacher. Clergy is anyone that preached a doctrine to you that you started to believe. As an end result, we all grow up, uh, Richard, believing things that are not true. We believe them to be true, right? We act on them as if they're true, but we find out that they're not true later on. And so that like all rich people are thieves. I was grown or, or men don't cry or some of these limiting beliefs we were all taught. And so I started, I was a belief person in failure mentality and thinking so it's self-image it is genetic to a degree because there's different personalities and some are more likely to achieve there's nine different personalities in the study of enneagrams ennea means nine in latin and gram is a diagram of these nine personalities so i learned how to communicate with different personalities and the more i learned the more i shifted the more i changed me the more practice my practice grew. As a matter of fact, you might want to know that in those days, and I was talking, speaking now, this, um, let's say we're in the 1970s, I went from 30 to 70 people a week to 100 people a day in one year in the same office and the same two CAs. Wow. So <laughs> you're, what you're saying, I want to see if I'm connecting all these dots correctly. We have a mental picture that we form of ourselves based on our upbringing and our experience and the influencers in our life and then those can provide either the fuel for our success or the limits on our success oh absolutely so we know that psychologists is uh, identify low self-esteem as the root cause of failure and mediocrity. And after working and coaching more than 30,000 chiropractors in or through my programs over all these years, I totally agree. And my knowledge comes from the years of observing all these people and watching how they function and how their triumphs or humiliations are absolutely caused by the mental images they have on yourself. So I can promise you that your self-image which is the way we see ourselves is the very core of your personality and it determines more about you than any other single factor affecting your uh, your practice or your personal life. 
So my life was then dedicated. First, I did marks and management, and we had a thousand clients learning the, the, what uh, what uh, what to say, what hours to have, how to hire and fire, how to do a report of findings, how to do a consultation, blah blah blah. And there's still people doing that. But uh, we we had people, Richard. Let's say there's ten people, and they would come to my seminars and read all my textbooks and listen to all the recorded material. And at the end of a year. Two people would succeed beyond belief, right? Two people would fail no matter what I did, and six people would fight for different levels of mediocrity. And my question was, how could that be? How could people, 10 different people, all graduating, let's say, from the same college in the same class, and they wore the same clothes, and they had the same parent, and the same religion, everything the same, 10 different people had 10 different results. And it was because it was based upon their personality, what they believed to be true or not, and how they were able to act it. Some had fears, some were, uh, had doubt, some had lower energy personalities, some were, were over-the-top personalities. And when you put it all together, it was how you see yourself. So right now, my cabinet experience, which I'm doing for 11 years, we work on that, letting the doctors find out where their blocks are. What are they afraid of? You know, you know, today, uh, Richard, and many chiropractors are still fighting the insurance fight, correct? Yes. So and and you would suggest them, well, why don't you just change to a cash based practice? And a lot would. It's simpler. It's cheaper. You make more money, but they're afraid to do it. So how do you overcome that? So it's not the technique. It's not your professional skill. It's not your office location. It's that you're just afraid. Well, how many doctors have a CA at the front desk that should not be there for whatever reason? Everyone knows it, but is unable to terminate that relationship and get a new and better and more high achieving CA that aligns with your principles and purpose. They let him stay. And the true story is I once said to a, a, a doctor, well, this is August. Why don't you just terminate the CA and, and move forward and let's get someone better and train her right and blah, blah, blah. He said, how can I fire her? Uh, you know, Christmas is coming. I said, this is August. You see me, they're just unable to do things. So doctors are unable to give the proper recommendations to people. They, they, they work by fear. And there's some that are technique oriented and some are philosophically oriented. None of that matters. What matters is how you see yourself and how you communicate to the outside world and how you, through your thinking and actions, are then able to attract into your life all the people, places, things, situations, and events that are necessary for your success, which is what happened to me. That's why my success came so fast. So and I think that answers the question. Well, let's, uh, let's look at what it takes to change ourselves. You know, you've laid out a, a very good case for we are uh, the result of our upbringing and other factors that have formed and shaped who we are. But let's say we're not getting the result we want. What are some of the tools that you teach to start rewriting our personality DNA? Well, I can give you the basic four, because we have a time limitation here, that's in my book, Talking to Yourself is Not Crazy. And by the way, for your listeners, there's a free download of the book, Talking to Yourself is Not Crazy. And we sold and gave out thousands upon thousands upon thousands of these books. It was written some years ago. Uh, it, it's about opening your mind so you can have it your way, so you can create your destiny, so your past doesn't have to determine your future, so you can change your relationships and you can change your prosperity quotient and you can change the volume of your practice and you can change anything you want. So, And, and so the big four would be this to me, affirmations, you know, the ability to talk to yourself, stop putting yourself down emotionally, physically, spiritually, by not only the words you say, but the thoughts you have and the feelings that you have. And then written goals so that you can, your, the goals are a map for your mind. That's your left brain has to have a map, a GPS system where it wants to go. And then meditations. And that doesn't have to be, uh, people get scared. It's not a formal meditation like Guru Maharishi, but a way of quieting your brain from that noise that's always in it, the chatter telling you what you can't do and what you're afraid and I'm overwhelmed and I can't do this and he told me that and she told me that. So the, uh, away, music does it, meditation. 
meditations do it just to cl- to lower the brain cycles from 14 to 21 per second which is where we are at right now to 7 to 14 which is just about the dream state because then you act- uh, activate the right brain which is the brain of creation the right brain creates the left brain does the left brain thinks and understands the right brain just sees uh, uh, uh sees things so the human brain thinks in pictures so it's affirmations goal setting meditations to quiet down and then the big key to all of it is visualization the ability to close your eyes in a in a lower cycle brains per second and sort of a meditation when you're quiet and picture visually picture not think not write not type but picture like on a tv screen your life or the practice you want you can picture here's an empty reception room you close your eyes and you picture a fil- filled one here's cas that are they're not doing the job and the office doesn't right here's a brand new clean modern x-ray unit and office that's clean and has fabulous staff to picture the things. Those are the big four. And we can take hours and hours upon them. And we work on it at the cabin for days, you know, so it, it's just, it's an incredible thing. Affirmations, talking to yourself, build yourself up in strong and noble thought before people knock you down. I remember people saying, even my father said, don't see a hundred people a day. You, you, you're going to wear out. It'll hurt yourself. You're going to get sick. And I would say, why would you want to put negative thoughts in my house? I reject that to myself. I wouldn't be disrespectful. I rejected that. I said, yes, if someone could see 100 people a day, I could. And I failed for so many years, so that became a drive. And that's not an indication of success, by the way. There are a lot of failures, believe it or not, as human beings that see 100 people a day. So money is not the, the, the yardstick, nor is volume. It's great relationships, a fabulous self-image, you know, um, a, a spiritual connection. It's it's providing some sort of service to humanity. And as an end result, the money and the numbers come as a result. So the bottom line, Richard, I would say that if the people listening to this would know if they change, then their world changes. So it's not if my wife or husband changes, if I get more CAs, when I get a a, a digital x-ray unit, when the insurance companies get off my butt, none of that counts. It's how you see and you react to the way the trials and tribulations that nature throws in your path. Well, I downloaded your book and uh, read through it, and I highly recommend it. I'm going to link to a copy of that in our show notes page for this show when this episode goes live. But... I want to touch on one of the things, uh, the four things that you mentioned, and that is affirmations. I saw that there are three different examples in your book, and I want you know to know why those are so powerful. I think whether we're conscious of it or not, uh, we talk to ourselves constantly, either out loud where we can hear it or, or silently by thought in our own mind. So without realizing, we either build ourselves up or we put ourselves down all the time, inadvertently, and we're actually part of the cause of our own success or pain or poor self-image. So if you constantly talk to yourself, repeat and review with regularity positive thoughts over a long period of of time, then your mind gets a new image of what you want to create, and it does it for you without caring if it's good or bad, right or wrong. It just carries out your command. So if I say an affirmation would be um, one of the ones in the book, I am a healthy, vital, active, and successful human being. I affirm this day that all tissues in my body are functioning perfectly, and that is the way it is supposed to be. So that's positive thoughts. But then I, if I say that while I'm stuffing chocolate cake into my mouth and having donuts all day and no green vegetables and not exercising, what you're saying is not going to meet your action. So the concept is to do the affirmations over and over and memorize the new ones so you can cloud your past. But then you must take action steps commensurate with what you're saying. So if you're saying I'm a generous person, then be generous. If you say, I'm a forgiving person, uh, then you have to be able to forgive people that have hurt you in the past, which is, by the way, there's two blocks to all of success. One is the inability to forgive someone in your past for having hurt you, and that's a hard one. And then the second one, which is a big daddy, and we spend three hours of it in the cabinet experience, fears, determining which fear you have. There's six basic and a hundred sub 
Right, but fear of abandonment, fear of rejection. Chiropractors are famous for that, fear of rejection. A patient doesn't follow your orders. They don't listen, and a doctor feels bad, so they lower their recommendations. Fear of rejection, fear of loss, fear of failure, fear of success. This is all of these different categories, and we have in the audience, they identify their fears and see they're no different than anyone else, and if they eliminate a fear, what happens if you eliminate a fear of uh, going on an elevator? And that's your whole life. So you can live, you walk up stories. But I had one person come to the cabin that turned down a job at double the current salary because he had to go to the 50th floor of the Empire State Building. And it so happens to be where a job office awaited for him to be a producer of New York Giant football and would not would not take the job because he had to walk. And nothing could change until his daughter got in and said, Daddy, if you're afraid of elevators, I now am too. So he came to me and came to the cabin, and now he does make that money and he does get on elevators. So how does fear flying? Is that important to your life? No, you don't have to fly, but if you do, it opens up the whole world. Elevators opens up more people to see. So the object is to get rid of the, the mental bars, the mental prisons we put ourselves in. So as chiropractors, when I, you know, I had a thousand chiropractors in the master circle and a different thousand in the marks and connection because the master circle, the difference was we added this component to the procedural component. Now you have procedure and the way to handle it and think. And when you come to the cabin, we don't even talk about chiropractic or procedures. We only talk about you succeeding, you creating your life. So we start with the affirmations. Uh, I, I, I'm so excited about it. Affirmations, gold, meditations, visualizations, those are the four. Well, what do you say to, to the person who says, well, um, you know, I, I'm, I want to be better, I want to do better, but I, I like who I am, and that's my authentic me, and uh, it's it comfortable, and I, you know, I'm unsure about that. Okay, that's a great question, Richard, a great question, because they hear it every day. One... I want to be nice because on the radio, but what they're saying, they have backed into that feeling because it's a safety net, but it is not true. When I'm, when people say I'm comfortable, it means I know that I'm limited, but I'm willing to accept being here. So that's the average chiropractor, by the way, and the average person in the world. But look out at this world. Are they succeeding? And I don't mean you have to be a superstar, but surely you can be better. Being comfortable means being limited. It means I'm unwilling to take a risk. I'm unwilling to try something new. I'm unwilling to change. So and, and some of the t people, uh, when they start to change, they feel uncomfortable. So they go right back into their comfort zone. You know, it becomes... Uh, they do an affirmation, for instance, and three weeks later, they don't increase their practice by 95%. They say it didn't work for me. It didn't work because you didn't work it. It's your belief system. So I think being comfortable is is mediocrity. So in my way of thinking, and I'm not saying it might be yours, mediocrity is like uh, uh, mayonnaise, which has no color. It's white, right? It's not ketchup, which is red and, and spicy and has some good looks to it, or mustard, which is yellow, it's white, it's bland. That's a bland life. And if that's, but it's, it's America, you can do whatever you want to do. I think most people can achieve more, do better, save more money, be healthier and happier. And I'm and not, it's not a race for the biggest money, but you have to admit that in every walk of life, money solves some problems. If you earn it by, by service to humanity, then take all you can. Because it's the universe's way of rewarding it. Well, I've heard of the yo-yo diet, but in reading your book, you talk about something called the yo-yo syndrome. What is that? <laughs> you know, when I was studying all these doctors, and remember, I had thousands of doctors in. I've spoken in every state association in America. I've spoken at every college and around the world. So, you know, I've been around for a lot of years, 55 years as a chiropractor. And I say um, the yo-yo syndrome is that I notice that people are up or down by what happens to them. So if you're alive, there's a good chance you're, you're suffering from an infectious disease that I think is so highly contagious that infects over 80 percent. A yo-yo, you're, uh, you're, uh, 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 let me explain it this way. If something good happens to you, you're elated and you're up. OK, so the mailman comes with a check for a P.I. check for three thousand dollars. So it's a good day. So you feel good. You're buoyed by spirit. The mailman dies. You're down. 
You get five new patients here up. You get no new patients here down. You have you have the wedding of a daughter or a confirmation or some nice thing happens in your family. You're up. Right. Or your loneliness drives you down. So people are up and down and they are up and down, Richard, by what happens to them, not by what they're creating. So in other words, I don't give anyone, not you, not anyone, but me and my maker permission to put me down. I already put myself down enough. I don't need any help. So instead of being up and down by what happens to you, I have goals and affirmations of what I want. So winners compare their goals to their own achievements, whatever they may be, and losers compare their goals to everyone else, what they're doing. Well, I'm not everyone. I work on me continually. So I'm 76 years old next week, right? And I still do my affirmations and I have them. And people say, why do you do that? You're rich. You don't have to, you don't have to do it. You don't, have, I don't have to work anymore. I work because I love it. I enjoy helping people. The cabin, we, we are, we're like a family coming together. And I'm in touch with all of the people for these 11 years have gone to the cabin experience and hundreds of others. We're still in touch. We're friends because they are on the grow. So that's what I'm talking about. So the yo-yo is up and down. I want to cut the string. I call it yo-yo-itis, inflammation of your yo-yo. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, one of the things you talk about in the book is the power of, of observation. What is that? Okay, so so most people, when, when we come into the cabin experience, for instance, people come, the number one lesson I tell them, most people are, are not observant as to who they are in their environment, how do you react? How are you dressed? How, the words you use, the syntax of your sentences, the feelings you have. We're not self-observant people. So I can look at people and I do it at the cabin and I pull up a couple of people and by the way they stand, by the words they select, by the tone of their voice, by who they, by the colors they wear, I can observe something about them. So when you're communicating with someone, we always get, like chiropractors give the same report of findings to everyone. But I'm a driving personality, as you can hear, and there are amiable personalities. So we should be communicating not the way we are. We should be communicating by the what the other person, who they are, so they can hear you. So if I was talking to an amiable, um, mild-mannered reporter from the great metropolitan newspaper, Clark Kent, I would lower the tone of my voice, speak a little slower, and communicate in a way they would hear and understand me. And it's not because they're dumb, they're just different. And if I would say, listen, you will have to come three times a week for the rest of your life and refer 75 people, and you have to do it by Tuesday, I would overwhelm them. So what I've learned to do by observation is if they cross their arms when they're sitting in the consultation room, I cross my arms. If they cross their legs, I cross my legs. If they speak rapidly, I do. If they speak slower, I do. So I uh, 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 I change who I am to communicate. So to I observe. I watch people. The way I, I was on an airplane yesterday, right? And uh, this woman came. She's probably... I'm guessing 50, 60 years old, and she had one of these suitcase of things that you put up in the overhead rack, and, and she could not do it. And I'm looking around, and there's three men, three times the size of me, so it took me at 76 years old and said, may I help you? She couldn't do it, and nobody got up to help her. So I observe that, and then I sit down, and I say, you know what? You just did a good thing, Larry. The universe will reward you. So I'm in the business of growing myself and observing the outside. And the truth is, this sounds ego, but it's not. I don't want to be like 80% of the people in the world. I don't want to be poor. I don't be, I want to be alone. So, uh, you know, I don't want to be, uh, have a poor practice. So instead of saying I want to be, I train my doctors, just stop tell, saying what you don't want. I don't want to be fat. Start saying what you do want. I want to be thin and healthy and strong. Do you see what I'm saying? So the observation, the only way you can know where you are, look at your home. Is it cluttered? Is your office cluttered? Are you timely? If you're not early, you're late is in the book. But if you're cluttered, here's the point. And you observe your office or I come in and your office is cluttered. I wouldn't be your patient because cluttered on the outside means you're also cluttered on the inside. So I am timely and I am neat. And it's part of the culture that I create. Does that answer that? 
It really does, and I think it's an important point, especially in this day and age where the cultural mantra is uh, judging is is wrong. But I think that we are always judging each other person to person, and if we're blind to that, we're really missing out on all of those cues. And I think even if society is saying, hey, judging is wrong, don't do it, it's still happening. And that's <laughs> we have to always be putting our best foot forward. And I was in retail sales and other sales before I was a chiropractor. And what you're talking about, that sort of reflective modeling, the truth is, is that um, people like other people who remind them of themselves. And so, you, you know, if someone I, I, I would like to manner, something just to jumped in my head. I'm sorry for interrupting. Oh, something, ahead. something just jumped into my head. You, you said, uh, you asked me a question before. What's wrong with being comfortable? And I gave you this long-winded answer because it is stagnant, right? It, it's habitual. There's no leadership in comfort. It, it, you know, the, the, there's no uh, leadership characters. It is all about fear, and it's all about the need to be liked. People that are comfortable are afraid that if they take a risk or take a chance or modify and do something new, they will not be liked. So for many chiropractors who are basically touchy-feely people, I think you will agree, they would rather be liked than have more new patients or, or raise their fee or, or give them the right recommendations. They give the easiest ones because they need to be liked. Yeah, so I mean, I think letting that go, getting out of that comfort zone, that's where all the good stuff happens. And, uh, and learning that uh, you're not in a vacuum, you're, your image is a real thing, your interactions with people uh, and how you look and are perceived are all important things to master. Well, you have talked a bit about the cabin experience, and we talked about it in the intro. Give us a little more uh, of an overview of what that's all about. Well, the, you know what? The cabin experience is the outreach of when I was at the master's circle, we had a high achievers group. You had to be seeing a thousand people a month or better. And it was about 75 doctors. And in one day, uh, a guest speaker didn't show up or, uh, you know, and I, we had a void. So I stood up and did my thing, the Larry thing. Right. And I said, well, I want to thank all of you sitting in the audience um, because for all these years, you've paid your money, you've left your homes and your practices to come to learn and honor yourself and honor me. And I want to thank you for that. What I really need to do, though, because you're all you've all grown. You're in this winner circle. You're in this high achieving group, but you're only stuck at a higher level of numbers and, and you're a better person, but you're stuck again. So what I need to do is take off my tie and jacket and in yours and stick your butts up in a cabin somewhere in the woods where there's no telephones, no communication and give me 60 hours, three days to get a piece of your mind, right? And, and we'll find out what greatness potential you really have. And so I'm doing, that's the Larry thing. You know, it's, it's called the stick and run. I plant an idea and I run away and they come after me. So we went out and then we had lunch. So lunch is tables of 10, you know, in all these seminars, we have tables of 10. And I always had my nameplate so I could sit and watch everybody around and make sure everybody's comfortable. And I got back to my seat with my name tag tag on it uh, and there, there were there were 40 or 50 business cards I'm in I'm in I'm in. I, and I said, well, what, what are you in for? And I and he said, I'm coming to the cabin. What cabin? You just said lock our butts up in a cabin. I didn't even have a cabin. I didn't have the textbook. And that was 11 years ago. And we do about three a year. And everyone has filled the capacity. I don't much advertise it. It's by recommendation or the ability to attract people. So here's about the cabin. Can you imagine you're spending three incredible and magical days working on yourself and learning how to change your entire life for the better. That was my thought. And what if you could really improve your life by participating in a process that is guaranteed to help you change the way you think, change the actions you take, change the feelings you have, and as an end result, actually create a remarkable life, not just uh, hearsay, having nurturing, fulfilling relationships and all the success. So the cabin, uh, Richard, is an intense and amazing two and a half days, totally safe, interactive. The, it's not me spieling like I'm doing now. It's interactive, personal growth conclave designed to get people in touch with their inner self while teaching them the following. So I'll read this right from my book. Deal with your past and handle the present and invent a better future. Gain the resources needed to overcome negatives and hurts from the past and resolve the stories and reasons that block happiness. 
And finally, to create an abundant health, wonderful relationships, a thriving business and financial freedom. So that's that's the key to the cabin. The next one is going to be March 30th to April 2nd, 2017. And it's probably going to be the last one because it's 11 years now. It's time to me reinvent myself. And I have another good idea of the five businesses. So I'm going to freshen it up. And the next one is going to be my own home. We already have eight people registered for that date. So we're looking for 12 more to fill it out. You don't have to be a chiropractor. And this is what I suggest people uh, can do, Richard, with your help, right? Go to www.thecabinexperience.com. That's the cabin's website. Look through it. Look at the pictures. Look at the testimonials. See the superstars that have been there and the average doctors or non-doctors and people from all walks of life. Right. You don't have to be because we don't even mention chiropractic there. Right. And uh, see the dates, read through it. And then if it does interest any of your people and you want to, this is my invitation. My telephone number is there. It's five one six three one eight one four four four. And call me personally for a chat to see if this is a good fit for you. And I also promise I'm not going to talk you into something that you don't want to do. I'm not going to sell you on anything. We just want to see if it's a good fit. So if you're re- ready, most people that are, uh, are uh, many people that come are already tremendously successful. They just want to fix parts of their life, like getting rid of some of the past anger and pain and things of that nature. I don't know what drives people, but that's the best way to do it. Give me a call. 15 minutes. We'll find out if it's good for you. I'll tell you the cost. The next one is in Boca Raton, Florida, in my home, and you will be my guest. So um, uh, that's my explanation. I don't want to sound like I'm selling anything to what I get excited about it, though, because the results here far outpace anything that I've ever done before in my life. The results are enormous. Well, what a neat project, and we're definitely going to be linking to that in our show notes. Dr. Larry Markson, thank you so much for spending time with us today and sharing all of the wisdom and and wit and humor and the things you've overcome in your life. I've enjoyed your book and getting to know you um, as part of preparing for this podcast. Richard Day, thank you so much. I, I love young, bright people like yourself working on helping the chiropractic profession. And this Mojo Nation is, I'm in, I'm aboard. I love the thought of it. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to the Cairo Business Mojo Podcast at www.cairobusinessmojo.com.